Good afternoon. I'm Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. And we today will have part two of our discussion on U.S. economic and diplomatic policy toward Asia and the Pacific region as a whole. That's today's and yesterday. For those of you who were here, we had an incredible Khalil and Ryan Haas on U.S. relations with China, which is on uh, YouTube, the FBI YouTube channel. If you miss and listen to it again, we'll be recording today's event. Uh, so you, will, you can listen to it afterwards if you wish, or uh, if you miss part of it, you can listen to it. Um, today, as I mentioned, we'll be talking about the, the Biden administration approach to rebuilding economic and diplomatic with our Asian partners. Um, also uh, talking about uh, Biden's approach to some of the emerging crises in, in the region, such as the recent Myanmar coup. Um, for that discussion, we'll have again, our Asia program, Jacques Delisle will be moderating and he is also in addition to his affiliation with He's the Stephen A. Cousin Professor of Law, Professor of Political Science, and Director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, our gay, Michael Oslin, is also a Senior Fellow of FPRI's Asia Program and our National Security Program. In addition to that, he's also the Payson J. Treat Distinguished Fellow in Contemporary Asia at Stanford's Hoover Institution. Um, it should be a terrific discussion. If you have questions, about halfway through the program, be going to your questions. So please put them in the Q&A box, uh, not the chat. Um, we'll be putting some maps in the chat as well as some links uh, to FBI's webpage. If you have any kind of technical problems, let us know in the chat and we will attempt to, call, to help you with them. So uh, thank you again to our sponsors. And without further ado, let me turn it over to Jacques. Uh, thanks, Raleigh, and thank you all for joining us today. It's a great pleasure to welcome back to FBRI, Michael Oslin, Nisha Oslin. He, uh, he has all the uh, distinguished posts that Raleigh just mentioned. I'll also add that he is the author of Asia's New Geopolitics, Reshaping the Indo-Pacific in the 21st Century. And before that, The End of the Asian Century, War Stagnation and the Risks to the World's Most Dynamic Region. You can find his writings in the Wall Street Journal, The Spectator, Foreign Policy, lots of other venues. And uh, in a prior life, he was a professor of Japanese history at Yale University. And so I think I may start with that to take you, uh, to take you back to the Japan angle, which is that if we look back at the Trump administration, it was, I think most of us would say, not a great time uh, for US relations with many allies. Japan sort of stood out as a bright spot. The Trump-Abe relationship, the broader US-Japan relationship uh, was rel on relatively sound footing. Well, now Trump is gone and Abe is gone. Uh, and many of the sources of friction in Japan's relations in its neighborhood, particularly China, are still there. Uh, so what do you see happening on, on that front? What, what are the implications and the challenges for Biden policy toward Japan? Uh, Jacques, thank you. Uh, Raleigh, thank you. It's always a pleasure to be back uh, talking with FPRI and, and the wonderful audience that, that we have here. So it's, it can't be a more timely discussion, I think. Uh, than talking about Asia as a whole, the Indo-Pacific broadly. And I think um, to, to maybe make a segue from the, the session yesterday uh, with Ryan Haas, um, what we deal with in, in when we think about China is really we're dealing with the entire region. I mean, in some ways, of course, we're dealing with the entire world, but we're really dealing with something bigger than just China. We're dealing with the Indo-Pacific, which is 3 billion plus people and 40 to 50 percent of global output. So it's, it, it's, it's the region itself is what we really need to be focused on because you can't get China right if you don't get the region right. And for the U.S., in many ways, getting the region right starts with allies. And among those allies at the very top of the hierarchy is Japan because of the length of our alliance that goes back to 1960, the, this version of the alliance, uh, because of Japan's role as, Japan, as Asia's largest uh, and, and oldest democracy, because of the extraordinary contributions it's made to regional stability uh, and the like. And in fact, you know, Jacques, we, we sort of take Japan for granted, um, which, you know, in diplomacy and international relations, 
is often a sign that things are going well, right? You don't have problems you have to focus on, like problems that we're focusing on with China, for example, or, or North Korea. Uh, with, with Japan, it's, it's been largely quiescent. Now, that said, it's interesting because Japan's environment, Northeast Asia, uh, has changed dramatically over the past couple of decades with the rise of China, the nuclearization of North Korea, uh, and the like. Um, what some would say is a, a relative decline in, in U.S. power there. But I would also say the, the eternal challenge of maintaining uh, the democratic momentum uh, in Asia, whether it's Northeast or Southeast or, or all of Asia, so even though we've we've sort of turned our eyes away from Japan, uh, in part because we've been so transfixed with what's been going on in China, it continues to play an essential role in uh, Asian economics and Asian stability and Asian politics uh, and the like. And you're right, under the Trump administration, um, relations were fairly good. Now, this was a choice on the part of former Prime Minister Abe, who left office last year, um, to reach out directly and personally to Trump uh, to try to create a, a very one-on-one a -on -one personal relationship, I think reading Trump's personality correctly. Uh, and for the most part, even though the rhetoric would, would occasionally flare up, for the most part, not only did they have a very good personal relationship from everything that, that we could tell, um, Japan escaped a lot of the, um, the attempts by the administration to uh, raise higher tariffs or, or do it on a permanent basis, which it did on, on a number of allies. Uh, there was talk about pressuring Japan on um, the, uh, the host nation's support for U.S. troops. That never really materialized. Instead, Abe essentially made himself the trusted, uh, the, the trusted partner of Trump. So now they're both gone. So now we have President Biden in the U.S. and Prime Minister Suga in Japan. Um, Suga was uh, Abe's right-hand man for uh, almost his entire time as Prime Minister. Um, he is not the same type of a uh, flashy character or, uh, or certainly the sort of bigger think strategically oriented character uh, that Abe was. Foreign policy is not the thing that necessarily gets him out of bed in the morning. Um, but he has indicated all of his commitments to uh, Abe's approaches on the economy, uh, to foreign policy, to the Quad, which I hope we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, and the like. Um, I think he's going to find a good partner in President Biden. And in fact, you've already had calls between Suga and Biden. You've had calls between uh, the foreign minister and the secretary of state and the defense minister and, and the U.S. secretary of defense. And very importantly, in, in those calls were stressed that the U.S. under the Biden administration reiterates the commitment to uh, protecting the Senkaku Islands under Article 5 of the Alliance, and also um, uh, that the Quad is going to be something that is important to both countries. So I think what we see is that there is a good basis uh, for relations going forward. Uh, the Trump administration agreed with Japan a free trade, the basis of a free trade agreement. I think under the Biden team, you'll probably see them look to re-enter the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which I would support, uh, and I think they'll remain fairly close on most of the issues that we face. Okay, a lot of issues there, and we'll be looping back to uh, to a bunch of them. Sort of one point of clarification for our audience, Article 5 of the Mutual Security Treaty, uh, where basically the, the U.S. says that extends to, among other things, uh, protecting de facto Japanese control over the disputed islands in the East China Sea, which we either call the Senkaku, the Diaoyu, or the Diaoyutai, depending on, on which of the, uh, the claimant's perspectives you're looking at it from. And we saw that reaffirmation uh, back in the Obama administration, too, when we had friction uh, between, uh, between China and Japan. Um, so Article 5 uh, is, is one article that matters. Let me toss out another article of another document that plays into Japan's security role, which is one of the things Abe pushed for was relaxing the constraints of Article 9, the, the peace provision in the Japanese constitution. It was, it was part of closer defense cooperation with the US, part of Japan playing a more normal security role. Where do you see that going under Suga? As you say, he's a less kind of dramatic actor in many ways than Abe, and, and that was one of Abe's more dramatic moves. But, but do, do you think, does Article 9 matter? And Article 9 aside, do you see Japan continuing to return to what we would call a more normal security role in the region? It's a good question. I think um, uh, Article 9 is very symbolic. Um, you know, the, the statement that Japan will never 
uh, use war as a as a national tool or have a uh, um, you know the means of national of, of waging war, meaning a military. And of course, Japan has a military. It has one of the world's best militaries. Not, not battle tested like the US, for example. Uh, but of course, we should also remember the Chinese aren't particularly battle tested either. Um, but about a $50 billion a year defense budget that went up every year modestly under Abe, very high tech and advanced uh, with F-35s and very good submarines, um, uh, all different types of, of weaponry that, that is uh, at, at the cutting edge, extremely highly trained uh, as well. So. Um, what Abe really did was remove all of the legal constraints that gave life to Article 9, um, things like not being able to engage in collective self-defense with allies and partners, uh, not being able to really uh, sell any type of uh, defense weaponry abroad or engage in joint, uh, joint development of, of defense weaponry. All of those things have, have been uh, um, removed. They were essentially cabinet determinations or legal determinations of what Japan could do in the post-World War II period. And almost all of them are gone. So for Abe, revising Article 9 was extremely symbolic. It was to make Japan a normal country. Uh, in fact, he wanted to rename the self-defense forces the Japanese military, you know, the Japanese army, the Japanese navy, and the like. And he didn't do, he didn't do either of those things. But I think for the most part, it doesn't matter. I think what you see is that Japan has largely normalized uh, its its actions as a as a um, a security player in the region, it has a uh, it, it's not a full defensive alliance like they have with the United States, but essentially an alliance with Australia. Uh, in fact, they just signed uh, an agreement to be able to cross service uh, military equipment, um, deep relations with India, particularly between uh, Prime Minister Modi and. Prime Minister Abe, uh, deep relations uh, throughout Southeast Asia, where Japan gives an enormous amount of development aid, but also has its Coast Guard down there, is involved in maritime security training uh, and the like, so that it, it does about as much as any country uh, in the region is, is going to do. And it has the capacity to do more than essentially any other country in the region except except for China. So I think you're going to see that continue. I think you'll see uh, debates on how you can further deepen the alliance. Uh, under the Obama administration in 2015, they revised the guidelines to the alliance, which talked about things like cooperation on cyber. They talked about things like cooperation in space. Um, all of that is becoming only more important because of the challenge uh, that countries are facing from China. And I'll just mention uh, you know, a specific element of that, which is last week, China announced new rules for the Coast Guard, the Chinese Coast Guard, to allow it to use lethal force weaponry to defend Chinese claims in, in contested uh, areas, contested islands, contested waters, to board ships in waters claimed by China. This immediately uh, earned a rebuke from the Philippines and worried uh, the United States to the extent of, of uh, uh, the um, Secretary of State, I think it was, um, announcing that the, the Philippines uh, would also fall under Article 5 of our treaty with the Philippines. All of this is, is an indication of just how concerned uh, the nations are with increasing Chinese aggressiveness and, and setting the stage to, to justify the use of, of force, and which can lead, of course, to a, a much greater armed conflict. And I think Japan's going to be central uh, in trying to figure out how to um, create a community of interests that makes very clear to Beijing uh, that they will not be able to cherry pick nations in, in essence, that there will be uh, groupings, whether it's the quad or, or other types of um, ad hoc groupings to, uh, to share information, to work more closely together, to train the navies and coast guards of these smaller nations, simply to create a norm of behavior that it will be not in Beijing's interest to upset. As we've seen uh, China pushing those uh, territorial dispute claims in a variety of ways. You say the rules of engagement from the China Maritime Service, the Coast Guard, is the most dramatic example. We've seen them uh, sail closer to the uh, Senkaku, sort of through the internal waters of Japan, claims around uh, those islands. And of course, there's a, an additional layer of meaning here in that by sending uh, the Coast Guard rather than the Navy. It's, an, it's, it's a sort of underpinning of the claim this is a domestic Chinese area. It's law enforcement uh, rather than and conflict. And we've seen these moves to, to undermine the de facto control of Japan in that region and of rival claimants in the South China Sea as well. So very fraught 
uh, stuff and part of what lay behind uh, the Article 5 reaffirmation. Uh, but you've mentioned the Quad a couple of times, and then you mentioned the countries involved in the Quad. Um, that's a grouping that, that China is not terribly happy about either. Um, how significant is the Quad per se? Where do you see it, it heading as a linchpin of, of U.S. security policy in the region? So it's a great question. So the Quad, uh, this, this would be, um, I guess you could say we're in version 2.0 of the Quad. The Quad started back in the first decade of this century, uh, really after the 2004 tsunami in Indonesia, uh, the Indian Ocean earthquake Christmas, um, uh, that uh, saw the United States, India, Japan, and Australia come together for uh, disaster relief and, and humanitarian assistance, particularly in Indonesia, but in other areas as well. Um, prime Minister Abe, uh, people forget, he was actually prime minister for one year from 2006 to 2007, then returned in 2012 for his eight-year stint. Um, but in that first short term, he proposed the idea of a quad, a quadrilateral security grouping of India, Australia, US, and Japan. Uh, it really went um, nowhere. There was a, uh, a brief meeting um, on the sidelines of an ASEAN, that's Association of Southeast Asian Nations Regional Forum. Um, but India was not yet ready uh, to take on China in that way, or at least be seen as, as, as lining up against China. Australia was very nervous about it, and the U.S. itself wasn't all that committed. So the idea died. Uh, Abe came back to office in 2012 and immediately began uh, plumping it again, calling it a quadrilateral uh, security diamond, basically. Um, and again, there wasn't a lot of a lot of interest, though. The you know five years on, there was a shift in perception of China. Well, fast forward to 2017, Donald Trump comes into office. The last years of the Obama administration saw an enormous amount of tension between the U.S. and China over the South China Sea, over cyber and other issues. And and Trump in his first year proposed that the Quad be revitalized. And of course, he found a very willing uh, partner in Prime Minister Abe. Um, so there were a couple of meetings. Uh, the the, um, the uh, leaders met on the sidelines of ASEAN. Uh, the foreign ministers met a couple of times. There were a few uh, exercises. Um, there had been one exercise back in, in uh, 2007. Um, but more or less, what you saw was a change in rhetoric. And the rhetoric was that the world's changed, Asia's, Asia's changed, China has changed, and so we need to change. I think the way to, to think about the Quad is that it's not going to ever be, or, or most likely, we'll, we'll you know, never say never, but will most likely never be a, um, a formal alliance. And again, when you think of the Quad, the U.S. already has formal alliances with two of the three other members, Australia and Japan, and has an increasingly close relationship with India. Uh, similarly for the others, the, the architecture and, and geometry of the Quad is that all of them have rather close relations with each other in, in different ways. Probably India and Australia is the weakest, but nonetheless, um, it's there. So the Quad in many ways, in many ways is aspirational. Um, it, it's not going to replace, for example, the U.S. hub and spoke system, and it, it shouldn't uh, replace the U.S. hub and spoke system of alliances. But what it can do, I think, is, is create again, a, a values-based community of interests of four leading and major democratic powers in the Indo-Pacific, four extremely important economies coming together to talk about things like maritime security, I would say supply chain uh, security, uh, next generation technological development, civil rights, civil society issues, and then figuring out how to act collectively, again, not in a way that um, uh, pledges them to, a, you know, an Article 5 type relationship. Uh, but there's no reason that broad debates about maritime security can't be conducted, uh, you know, under quad auspices that you could have more exercises, more training, figuring out, you know, which country is strong in which part of, of, Indo, of the Indo-Pacific, which partners they have in trying to leverage that into greater cooperation. So I think I think the Quad's going to remain important. You saw um, the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, state uh, that the, he saw the Quad as fundamental to the U.S. position in the Indo-Pacific, and apparently they've already proposed a meeting, a virtual meeting. So this is all good. I think what you have to do, though, is see how you would actually operationalize it, how you would actually make it um, decide what it's going to focus on, and then begin to go forward to create this, this again, this values-based community of interests and in action. We have a related question that came in in the Q&A, which I'll throw in here, which is, uh, since we're doing numerology here, the quad is four countries, and of course, they're the five eyes. 
uh, yeah, the um, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, US, UK Intelligence Alliance. Uh, and our question uh, is, says that it's um, his or her impression that, that China makes a big deal of talking about the five eyes rather than the quad. Uh, so how do you rate the importance of the five eyes? And is, is China's attempt to point to, to, to underscore that rather than the quad, is that you know, strategic behavior of some sort or are they less worried about it, more worried about what it's your take? Uh, the Five Eyes is important. Uh, the, the information sharing is increasingly uh, important and I think it's going to get more important as you see the UK get more involved in the Indo-Pacific. Um, the UK is undergoing what they're calling an integrated review right now. That's a little bit like our um, well, we don't have anything quite like it, but it's essentially what, what is being done to create a new national security strategy in the U.S. Uh, and Britain will most likely write a security strategy as well as an Asia-Pacific strategy. Now, they are behind France and Germany, for example, uh, which have both released Indo-Pacific strategies. Um, but the British have, have talked a lot about um, increasing, uh, actually, what they call going back east of Suez. So returning to a role in the Indo-Pacific that they gave up. Uh, at the end, during the 1960s, at the end of the 1960s, um, they, they're going to be sending their new aircraft carrier, the Queen Elizabeth, into the region for uh, freedom of navigation operations. Certainly, there is an enormous amount of cooperation that they will do with the U.S. and can do with Japan. Uh, Britain has a, a lot of territory uh, through, uh, through overseas territory, uh, expats in the region, as well as, of course, relations with Commonwealth countries. So I think when you see Britain get more involved, you'll actually see the five eyes become a, a more focused on Asia. Right now, they're, they're sort of focused globally. They've been focused a lot on um, uh, terrorism and, and the like. But I think you'll see them focused more on security, uh, security issues. And China certainly doesn't want to see more players, especially players that have the, the heft of a country like Britain, uh, getting involved. Um, there's been talk, of course, about bringing Japan into the Five Eyes. It has different uh, information security laws and intelligence practices, so I don't think you're going to see that immediately, but I do think you're going to see increased information sharing among them uh, and, and sort of a quasi-Six Eyes in, in, in where specific um, issues, let's say, related to maritime or island security, there's a lot of information sharing between Japan and the partners. Um, again, what China doesn't want to see are these multilateral groupings. Beijing likes it when it can go one-on-one -on -one against a country, when there's a bilateral um, uh, environment that, because, I mean, who can stand up to the 800, you know, pound uh, gorilla or 800 pound elephant in the room? You really can't. Uh, and so any of these communities that develop, especially ones that begin to link the smaller countries with the bigger countries, uh, it creates a lot of, of concern in Beijing because it doesn't want to see, um, you know, the, uh, something that would, let's say, be more effective than ASEAN. You know, ASEAN China has been very successful. Beijing has been very successful in inserting itself into the process, buying off Laos and Cambodia, and I would say Myanmar, Burma as well, so that ASEAN has always restrained from getting more involved in issues related to, uh, uh, you know, freedom of navigation, openness, maritime security, and the like. So if you do an end run around that and you're be beginning to create new communities, that's something that Beijing is not going to like to see, especially if you get the Europeans involved. So we're hopscotching around the map here. We've gone from Japan down to India and Australia, uh, tagged over to New Zealand and the UK. Uh, so let's go to, to one other place that's up in a couple of the, uh, the questions in the Q&A function, which I, I know is an area of interest to much of our audience, which is the Taiwan question. Uh, so uh, Japan-Taiwan relations have improved remarkably in the last few years. Uh, uh, the sort of late Abe uh, term, there was a much warmer uh, relationship. Partly that's Abe, partly that's the DPP, uh, the Democratic Progressive Party coming to power in Taiwan, which traditionally has better ties with Japan, especially compared to Ma Ying-jeou, who famously, a uh, KMT predecessor, who famously wrote his doctoral dissertation on why those islands really belong to the Republic of China. Uh, but we've seen an uptick there, but it's been going on for more years than that. We've seen gradual growth in Taiwan-Japan um, security cooperation. So how significant is that tie? And to ask the really big question, uh, if the tensions in the Taiwan Strait continue to escalate, as they have been again in the last few years, and China uh, continues to take a more assertive uh, position, uh, perhaps uh, into the gray zone, maybe getting into the dark gray zone of, of uh, behavior around Taiwan, what, sh what will or should the U.S. do uh, to cope with that mounting pressure and uh, possible ultimate crisis? 
Yeah, this is a, um, a question that is increasingly, I think, um, on the minds of people in Washington and Tokyo. I mean, obviously, you know, you you are a Taiwan expert and one of FPI, FPRI's great strengths is on Taiwan. So uh, it, it's, I think, perfectly, you know, uh, appropriate to talk about it in terms of this, uh, the conversation today. Um, I, I think for Japan, uh, the, the cooperation with Taiwan is very quiet. Um, they don't want to talk about it that much, of course, because of, of you know, fear of uh, unnecessarily causing, um, you know, more, more tension with Beijing than there already is. Um, but you can't, you know, look past, I would say one of the other um, legacies of the Trump era is a, it was a much more robust engagement with Taiwan. Um, you know, some of that started under the Obama years, such as the planning for the new uh, American Institute of Taiwan. That's our our non-embassy embassy there, beautiful, huge new building. Uh, that was that was under the uh, Obama years. But um, you know what what Trump did in terms of attempting to essentially you know normalize relations with Taiwan in many ways, sending cabinet members. Um, you know, are advocating for Taiwan. Uh, at the very end, of course, uh, then Secretary of State, former Secretary of State Pompeo lifted all of the restrictions on meetings between U.S. and um, uh, and uh, and Taiwanese counterparts. All of this, you know, uh, really pushed the envelope on on where the U.S. was with Taiwan. And I think it sent, you know, strong messages to Tokyo, and of course to Beijing, but to Tokyo uh, about, these, about these issues. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think that the question for the Biden administration is how comfortable are they with maintaining the very public level of uh, talking about uh, in deepening and improving relations with Taiwan. Um, Secretary of State uh, Blinken has stated, you know, that that they will continue, uh, that Taiwan is integral. And in fact, the uh, Taiwanese representative uh, in Washington was invited to the administration, uh, to the inauguration, that that was excellent and very important. Um, but, you know, for Beijing, of course, it's going to be very easy to put pressure on wa uh, Washington as well as Tokyo to step back publicly, again, to sort of rhetorically isolate Taiwan, which can slide into actually isolating it, you know, actually, I don't know what the, you know, the term is, not virtually, but, you know, actually isolating it in the world. Um, China's been, you know, successful in using international organizations against Taiwan, uh, the WHO, keeping it out of the WHO and not sharing information about the coronavirus that began in Wuhan, China, um, the ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, keeping Taiwan out of that, the telecommunications union. Um, this is where Washington needs to be uh, to be pushing back, uh, and and was somewhat under the uh, under the Trump administration, for example, uh, supporting I think a Singaporean candidate to the into the uh, the in International Intellectual Property Organization to head that instead of a Chinese candidate, but continuing to push on getting Taiwan involved in these international organizations, but maintaining the level of meetings that we have of normalizing. Taiwan being in the room, I think that's important and we should make it a priority with the allies, with Japan, with Australia, with India and others, that we should be pushing to have Taiwan always at the table. Um, if you want to close Confucius Institutes here, then why don't you open up Sun Yat-sen Institutes from Taiwan? Uh, there's a lot of things you could do, I think, to increase Taiwan's position in the United States, but also in the region with allies. Yeah, I think that that uh, speaks to a lot of uh, a lot of the issues there. Of course, uh, the U.S. relationship with Taiwan is complicated by the absence of the kind of security treaty. I'm referring to something that came into the Q and A box here that we don't have a security treaty with Taiwan. We did with the Republic of China back in pre seventy nine, uh, but there is not the easy go to move of simply uh, uh, reaffirming the interpretation of the text of a treaty like we have with Japan or the Philippines, that's that's tougher. Uh, and I, I take very much take your point that the U.S. position of stronger support for Taiwan's international participation, you know, which is a longstanding idea, it's gotten some reinforcement during the Trump era with various uh, bits of legislation out of Congress, including the Taipei Act, uh, most evidently. Um, uh, but, you know, it's it, it works better for the U.S. when the U.S. is not out there alone doing it. It works better for Taiwan if, if it's not just the U.S. So having Japan and other heavyweights in there was part of what got Taiwan brief access to the WHA uh, following uh, SARS and such. Um, so this is certainly an important part of the strategy. For people interested in that aspect, I'll put in a plug for the video we should have up for our session with uh, with Bikin Xiao, the ambassador equivalent uh, from Taiwan that we did a couple of, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so the, um, the other issue that has, uh, has come up in a couple of the questions is yet another 
a security relationship in the region, which is Korea, South Korea, uh, but of course, inevitably means North Korea <laughs> as well. Um, and uh, Japan-Korea relations, I think it's fair to say, are, are not the smoothest relations among a pair of U.S. Uh, allies. So how do you see the Biden administration grappling with that, especially since we already know there's a North Korea review going on, right? That, that's clearly a, a front question, how to do North Korea policy. So um, you know, can we pull off that trick of, of dealing with uh, a pair of allies who don't get along so well and what is a, once again, chronically fraught uh, issue with North Korea and its nuclear program. Yeah, you well, first you're a master of understatement, Jacques, that they don't get along all that well. That's that's putting a very diplomatic gloss on it. And it's extremely concerning. Uh, and, and we should uh, continue to be worried about what is happening uh, between Tokyo and Seoul. Um, you know, these are in, in some ways, you know, our two closest allies in the region, uh, two of the most important economies, uh, two of the most important democracies. And the fact that, that their relations are in such essentially a deep freeze for so long uh, is, is problematic uh, by itself. It's problematic for the U.S. in terms of trying to make these alliances something that link together more. It's problematic in terms of uh, thinking about things like the Quad, because if you think about the Quad, I mean, you know, Korea should really probably be part of that. Um, you know, South Korea should be. So, so the first, the first issue uh, is, you know, recognizing that there's there's this very limited uh, space that we have to bring the two together. But I also think we really haven't been willing, quite frankly, to to um, to anger both of them. You know, by going behind closed doors into a locked room and banging heads together and saying, look, this is really in all of our interests and we've all got to figure out how to make this work. And if and if we don't, then, you know, there, there could be some some type of repercussion. Who knows what it'll be, but that the two really have to figure out how to get past how to get past all of this. Um, I mean, there were there were hopes, I think, uh, early in in. Um, uh, early in Abe's term, when he came to some agreements with uh, the Koreans uh, and uh, the former president um, uh, before, uh, uh, was it not Moon Jae-in, who's, who's currently, um, I'm just blanking on the president, not, not Pak kun hye but before her, um, there, there, were, there were some indications that there would be uh, you know, agreement on things like, in fact, they signed an agreement on comfort women. Um, it looked like everything was actually getting settled. They were going to have a military information sharing agreement. Um, all of that fell apart. And um, it, it's really, it's really a shame. And, and though I think they've, they've actually gone to a, a modified version, a limited version of the military information sharing agreement, I'll have to go back and, and double check on that. It still is not where we'd want relations to be. Um, in terms of North Korea, uh, look, I think it's the one place that all administrations need to get the benefit of the doubt in the sense that, you know, there's no good options left with North Korea. You know, the Trump administration uh, inherited, you know, a, a U.S. policy that had failed for multiple administrations. Um, they decided a very, you know, unique, I wouldn't say risky necessarily, but a pretty unique approach which was, um, let's go, you know, it was a South Korean idea, but they said, okay, let's go to the very top. We'll go to Kim Jong-un. We'll try to figure out if this is going to, you know, work to get the only person whose voice counts in North Korea, as far as we know, to get him to agree to, to relations. And, you know, they had three meetings, um, nothing really concrete came out of it. But, you know, what was the other option? Um, now, during the Obama years, they had what they called strategic patience, which was essentially eight years of waiting to see what was going to happen. They tried one very brief agreement in 2012, the leap year agreement, or uh, yeah, the leap year agreement, uh, leap day agreement, I think it was, um, I guess leap year, and it didn't work out. So we're, we're back to square one. Um, you know, the Korea, the North Korea of 2021 First of all, let's let's say there's something going on there that we just don't know. I mean, that's that's very clear. Under a dictatorship, you never want the type of uncertainty that you've had surrounding Kim Jong Un over the past couple of years, where he disappears from view for a long period. It looks like his sister might be coming very powerful, then she disappears from view, he disappears from view again. That's not normal in terms of a dictatorship. That's the last thing a dictatorship wants is any type 
of attempt to, um, you know, to really um, uh, uh, instill uncertainty in the part on the minds of the people that it's trying to control, let alone other factions within South Korea, uh, within North Korea. So that's the first thing we should recognize is just, just be aware that there may be stuff going on that uh, we really don't understand it, and it can become a crisis that we don't anticipate. Um, secondly, um, the North Korea of 2021 is not the North Korea you know, of 2009 that the Obama team inherited from George W. Bush. I mean, essentially, they've perfected ballistic, long-range ballistic missile capability. Um, they've, they've perfected that um, ability to um, target the United States, as far as we can tell. Um, they uh, have perfected, as far as we can tell, their nuclear weapons technology, whether they've fully been able to miniaturize nuclear weapons. It's, it's a little uncertain, but there's, there have been statements by senior U.S. officials that they have. So, um, so this is a nation that essentially has no incentive to give up these weapons. Um, the six-party talks failed. Um, China and Russia both continuously undermined sanctions that were levied against the North Koreans. And in fact, if you remember back to the beginning of the Trump administration, they put probably the hardest sanctions on North Korea. And that may have been the reason that Kim Jong-un was trying to get back to the negotiating table. So uh, the Biden administration, like all presidents going forward, has no very good options. You can either say, well, we're just going to try to keep talking and try to figure out if that's ever going to make a difference or um, we can uh, uh, try something new, or we can do nothing and wait. I don't think any of those are good, are good options, and it certainly doesn't help relations with allies. You remember at the end of the Obama administration, relations with Japan and South Korea over North Korea were, were not very good. They had seen what uh, North Korea had developed over the years of the Obama administration and were very concerned. And in fact, you started hearing talk in Seoul of it's time for our own indigenous nuclear capability because we can't trust the Americans. So um, I'll, I'll be honest, we all talk about it because that's what we do as people who look at Asia. I just don't think there's, there's very many very good options. It would be nice to see going back to hard sanctions to let the North Koreans know that um, we're gonna continue to box them in. But at some point you have to think about how do you live with a nuclear North Korea? And that's a different, that's a way different conversation. So one of the minor strands that's been woven through our discussion here is a stylistic change from Trump to Biden, a, a preference sometimes for somewhat more quiet approaches to these things. So, you know, do you announce your freedom of navigation operations? You just do them and then trust the Chinese will notice. Uh, you know, you don't have a Trump Abe dynamic between Biden and Suga, but the substance is in many ways not so radically changed. Um, Taiwan may be a different case because so much of the substance is symbolism. It's sort of standing up and, and supporting uh, space. But one of the areas where you probably have to be loud if you want to pursue it as part of foreign policy uh, are human rights issues. And uh, Biden has said that one of the principles of his administration's foreign policy, and this came through in the readout of the call we just got between Biden and Xi Jinping uh, from last night, uh, is that, that the, the human rights issues are going to be uh, receiving a greater emphasis. Um, Obviously, it's a, it's a chronic uh, friction between the U.S. and China, Xinjiang being the most evident example. We've also had a dramatic recent incident with the coup in Myanmar, which raises you know, democracy and, and human rights related issues. I know you've just written on that. So uh, would you sort of speak a bit to the, the place of human rights in the new administration's foreign policy toward Asia, uh, probably focusing on Xinjiang and, and Myanmar? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think um, th there's a lot to unpack there. First, I want to uh, give a... Uh, uh, hat tip to June Dreyer, who chatted in that uh, the name of the Korean president before Park geun was Lee Myung-bak. Yeah, it, it was Lee Myung-bak. I was going to say that, but let me add that that remembering Asian leaders named Lee is a longstanding American problem. Uh, George W. Bush, back in the debates, managed to come up with Lee for Lee Dong-hui, and there was <laughs> speculation of whether he meant Lee Myung-bak instead. But yes, now you can join the club of those of us whose memories are jogged and oh. Well, errors are corrected by June Dreyer. Yeah, you know, two, two, and now we've got to learn the names of the, uh, I had in my head this morning, the name of the uh, coup leader in Myanmar. Of course, it's gone now. Um, uh, Thailand, it's, you know, it's hard to, to um, because there's all, right. but the great thing is in North Korea, it's always Kim. See, that's, that's, that's the beauty. I mean, there's, there's, there's a benefit to the system that we, you know, we have to look on the, the bright side of things occasionally. Um, so this, this is a huge question. Um, let, me, let me go back just a little bit to talk about it for a second. So under the, under the Obama administration, uh, human rights were actually not a priority. And in fact, you had Hillary Clinton 
as Secretary of State early on say, we're not going to let human rights come in between us and China and dealing with China. Uh, you had the Obama administration, you know, basically lit literally give the back door to the Dalai Lama when he visited the White House. Um, there were a lot of things that they that they didn't do. Um, with the Trump administration, it was interesting because you had Trump himself seemingly very uninterested in, in human rights issues. Uh, and yet the administration took several different um, uh, uh, approaches to, to making human rights more important. One, for example, with, with relation to Burma, with Myanmar, was that they reinstituted some sanctions on the Burmese military for the Rohingya uh, genocide. They did that in 2019. Uh, those had been eased after 2011 and the power sharing agreement, and of course, 2015 and the election that brought uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and her party to power. Um, another focus of the uh, Trump administration uh, in the State Department was, uh, again, then Secretary of State, former Secretary of State Pompeo's um, Commission on Inalienable Human Rights, which was really about religious freedom around the world. Uh, that was stood up. They had a big report on it. Um, they clearly felt that that was extremely um, extremely important. One thing you did not see them do was push uh, the way that the Obama administration, again, what you did not see the Trump administration do was push the way the Obama administration had uh, on issues of, for example, gender rights or uh, LGBT rights, things like that, um, that, uh, that the Biden administration has indicated it may go back to. So I think the record for all administrations is mixed. You know, um, we can take this all the way back uh, well, we, look, we could go all the way back, right? We could go back to World War II, where we, you know, we were allies with the greatest human rights abuser in, in world history, Joseph Stalin. We could go back to the 1980s, where, um, you know, Gene Kirkpatrick was writing about dictatorships and double standards. There were dictators we were willing to work with and those we weren't. I think every president struggles with it. And I don't think by any means the, the Trump administration had entirely surrendered the idea. Now, to the Biden administration, very interestingly, the readout, you're right, of the call we got between Biden and Xi last night is that Biden brought up immediately uh, the questions of uh, Uyghurs in Xinjiang, a genocide. Oh, by the way, and, and the Trump administration declared it a genocide, or what happened was the State Department, this is legalese, but uh, made a finding that there was genocide, a determination that there was genocide against the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, uh, which is, you know, a, a something that... Um, you know, that oppression going on for a long time, prior administrations had not been willing to do, the Obama administration didn't, but they did it, Trump did it at the very end. Um, so Biden brought that up with Xi. However, we also got readouts of Biden's calls with both the Thai uh, and Philippines, uh, not Biden, but um, Secretary of State Blinken's calls with the Thai and Philippines counterparts, their foreign secretaries, where the human rights issues were not brought up. And you have human rights abuses in Thailand, you have under Duterte, of course, you've had the, uh, the, the, the hit squads and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of human rights abuses that basically scuppered US-Philippine relations under Barack Obama. You remember that Duterte's turn towards China happened under Obama because he hated that Obama was pushing him on, on equal rights for, uh, uh, for gays and lesbians. He was pushing him on not you know, executing drug users and drug dealers in the streets. Um, so, so again, it's been, it's been very back and forth. I think it would be very interesting if the if the Biden administration decides that it's going to adopt a neo Kirkpatrickian approach, and by that I mean they're going to downplay some of the human rights abuses with allies like Thailand, which is still a formal treaty ally, as is um, uh, as is the Philippines, um, but they're going to make it a, a major issue with countries like China. That would be a very interesting approach. And then, of course, you've seen. Uh, the Burma sanctions that uh, Obama, uh, sorry, that Biden put on last night, um, which were a billion dollars on the military, and he said there can be more coming. In fact, he called it an extraordinary national emergency, and I'm, 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 I'm interested in you know, in, or national security threat to the United States is what he called it, and I'm interested in the you know the 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 thinking behind that and why you know this the 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 coup in Myanmar raises to that level, but it is an interesting indication that with countries that are not allies, they may be willing to be calling out the human rights issues more than they will be with countries where we have strategic partnerships. And, and that may just be what's happened in the first two weeks. We'll have to see if it goes forward, uh, but it could be a, it could be a very interesting approach. 
I just note that one of the uh, more notable moments in Blinken's confirmation hearings, hearings of Secretary of State was he was asked about the genocide determination and, and basically you know, signed on to it. Uh, although we'll, we'll see if that if that fully sticks with obviously the controversial uh, label. I mean, I don't think anyone would dispute that there are horrible things going on in Xinjiang, but genocide is kind of a, a right. uh, label. Uh, so there's a question in the, in the Q&A um, that that's, follows up on this last theme and, and takes us back to Japan. Uh, and the question is that Japan has been traditionally, and I think still today, a little hedgy on, on uh, calling out sort of human rights abuses. The questioner particularly asked about the gap between what appears to be the U.S. position on, on Xinjiang and, and Myanmar and elsewhere and, and how far Japan is willing to go. Do you agree that there's a big gap there? And is it a problem for the kind of cooperation that, that you were at least implicitly urging in some of your earlier comments? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I, I I've come to think just because you know we we you deal with this stuff for so long and you talk about it and a lot of us sort of you know it's natural we get in in you know pretty well worn ruts of of sort of approaches to these issues, and uh, it, it is true Japan uh, is often much more willing to talk with countries that we determine have autocratic uh, or human rights abuses. They don't cut off aid. Um, we take a route that's often not always but often more moralistic. And I'm, and I'm coming to think that maybe that's a good thing. If, if what we could do is have Washington and Tokyo, which I think they do, agree on the end point, which is, you know, you don't want human rights abuses. You don't want, uh, you know, autocratic regimes. You don't want coups. The question is, how do you, um, how do you deal with them? And, and so I think it could be interesting to see if Washington and Tokyo could agree that what we want, of course, is to return to you know democratic rule in Burma, although let's let's recognize that Aung San Suu Kyi has been accused, of course, of, of genocidal crimes against the Rohingya. That she has been accused of anti-democratic authoritarian moves uh, to uh, you know to, um, to basically to decrease uh, democratic representation in the country. Um, you know the election seemed to be. Uh, so, so the reason there was a coup is because there were parliamentary elections back in November that Aung San Suu Kyi's NLD party won overwhelmingly, and the military-backed party did not win. Now, the military under the power-sharing agreement uh, in 2015 still kept a quarter of seats in parliament, uh, kept control of key ministries, including defense, where it could name the defense minister uh, and the like. So this was not a democracy that was fully... Uh, fully articulated yet, if I can put it that way. This was still a, a half democracy in which the military maintained a, an enormous amount of power. Aung San Suu Kyi was prevented from actually becoming president. She's the de facto leader. And she herself acted in anti-democratic ways. So, you know, we just have to be realistic about what's going on. But to the point, it would be interesting to see if, if Japan would, is we can use Japan to maintain communications with the, the junta, with the new leaders, uh, and the U.S. then works sort of publicly to put pressure on them, the moral opinion and the like, and see if if what those two tracks do actually allows you some more flexibility in dealing with them than if you had just one approach. So I'm, I think that these differences, and, and they are real, and I'm glad the, the questioner um, brought it up because it's, 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 it's very perceptive, um, but I don't think they're necessarily always negatives. Um, I think we could at least try to turn them into um, uh, somewhat innovative positives. The good cop, bad cop uh, doctrine of foreign yeah. policy. Uh, so we've been focusing mostly on security issues and move some into values issues. But what's always been a major theme, at least in the post-war era, in U.S. relations with East Asia has been the economic dimension. Uh, and that it's, it's a hugely dynamic region, deep U.S. trade and investment ties. Uh, and we now have a couple of recent developments that could be significant in changing the landscape. One is finally the launching of the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which wasn't started by China, but became China-led uh, and now is formally launched. And we have something which came as much more of a surprise because it wasn't something that was building for many years, which is the EU-China Investment Agreement, which took a fair number of Americans kind of by surprise. So that's happening on the china centered front. And at the same time, the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, exists out there as the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Partnership for uh, the sort of now Japan-led uh, TPP minus the U.S. Um, and uh, you, you said, you know, maybe the Biden administration will get back into that. And a lot of people in our world think it would be a great idea. Uh, but the domestic politics of that may be tough. 
Uh, you know, we haven't done a, a big free trade agreement uh, aside from tweaking uh, NAFTA into the USMCA uh, in, in quite a while. So is it fair to say we're seeing uh, China's presence in mega trade and investment agreements going up, uh, the U.S. not making that kind of progress? And is that a problem for us? Yeah, I think I think it is a problem. Um, it, it, it's complicated. Look, you know, what the Trump administration folks would talk about was actually um, – raising or, or reusing rhetoric that went back uh, at least to George Bush and I, I think earlier about not just free trade, but fair trade. They weren't the first ones to say we want to ensure that there's fair trade and that there's reciprocity in our trade relations so that we have access to markets uh, and there's not dumping and, and you know things like that. Um, you know, that is not what the U.S. has done in terms of dealing uh, with China or, or, or many of its trade partners. Um, so I think we have to start with that part because that's the domestic side of it is, you know, what, is there harm to us workers from, from trade agreements? And if so, how do you, how do you mitigate that? And it's not enough to simply say, well, they're going to be retrained because we know that doesn't happen. So you, you've got to protect, you know, you've, you've got to protect, uh, workers and you've got to protect, I'm sure, certain markets at, at certain times, like we should be protecting our semiconductor market and, and things like that, uh, and our 5Gs. Um, that said, uh, things like the TPP were not going to, you know, um, they were not going to lose us jobs in areas that hadn't already been affected. In fact, what TPP was doing was breaking down a lot of barriers with Japan. That was the main issue of TPP is that you brought together the world's first and third largest trading economies into a free trade agreement. The other countries were fine and important, but it was really about the U.S. and Japan. And it it was slashing tariffs on Japan, uh, slashing tariffs on U.S. exports to Japan of cheese and and beef and things and, and autos. Autos were always contentious and uh, were a slightly different part of that. But um, this would have been good for us, I think. And it's not that we would have lost any ground or or much ground from what we had already lost. So I think it was a mistake to go out of it. Um, now, the, the comprehensive and uh, progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership is, you know, it's a smaller grouping because the United States, the world's largest economy, is not in it. And it would be very significant if we got back into it. And I did see the question about domestic considerations. And that's exactly right. You know, let's not forget what Trump did was meld the concerns on the left about free trade and the concerns on the right about security and, and other issues and bring them together. And so it's the Democratic Party that for a long time has been skeptical of these free trade agreements that held up the Korea-US free trade, free trade agreement for years in Congress under Nancy Pelosi. And it doesn't seem like they're going to be going uh, uh, back, you know, in the other direction anytime soon. That said, when China does these trade agreements, they are definitely not at the same level of, of something like a TPP or a US trade agreement. Um, bilateral or multilateral. They don't have the same type of environmental protections, intellectual property right protections, um, uh, worker labor protections. Um, these, are, these are things that, um, that are very easy for China to have lots of agreements with. And there was a great deal of criticism of the EU-China agreement precisely because it went against almost, what, 40 years of EU ever more stringent and difficult regulated trade agreements. So Part of it you have to see is what actually happens when these trade agreements are are signed. Uh, you know, does it actually live up to what all the sides bid uh, or, or or claim that they're going to get out of it? Um, but then, secondly, you know, what is it that that's not covered and that that causes other countries to figure out new agreements that it wants to have or altering those agreements? And so, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that China's let's say running the tables on trade again because there's a lot of countries that are very dissatisfied with their trade agreements with China. That doesn't excuse us, I think, from not being involved and not figuring out what are fair trade agreements at this point that give us access, but ensure that, that the reciprocity uh, is, is not just one way, meaning we're just not opening up our markets and we're not getting access to other markets. So we should be very involved. It is incredibly heartening to see Japan take the lead on CPTPP. Again, another Abe initiative, you know, you think of Japan for those who were dealing with Japan in the 70s and 80s and 90s, you know, it was the closed great economy. 
It was the one you couldn't crack open. And now it's made enormous steps um, in terms of opening up agriculture much more than it used to. It's still not perfect. Uh, opening up uh, telecommunications, opening up banking, which, which it actually done a while ago. Um, a lot of this is, you know, it's, it's, it's a very different Japan and we should be taking advantage of it. I think we had an incredible opportunity to take advantage of it with Abe in office. And I hope we do with Suga. Yeah, and, and there's you know, one small point to add there, which is we've got, I think, different dynamics with the U.S.-centered and, and Chinese-centered trade agreements in the way that you largely alluded to, which is the U.S. concern is, uh, are the other parties going to fully to implement this? Is it going to be symmetrical? And the concern with the Chinese agreements is using economic dependence to political ends and the fact that the agreements are not as thorough liberalizing so they they have high profile without necessarily as much content and we've gotten a somewhat ambiguous signal from the Biden administration on the one hand we've gotten uh, language straight out of the Obama administration in the TPP context which is the U.S. should be leading and writing the rules for the world economy that's TPP language from from uh, the, the 2010s early 2010s um, and on the other hand you've got this uh, this build back better this concern for American jobs and be interesting to see how that plays out and of course, the TPP was in trouble before 2016 <laughs> in terms of getting through Congress. We're almost up against our time here, so I want to throw two last things at you. Uh, one is a, a, a question or a comment from our former president of FPRI, Alan Luxemburg, whom I know you know, who says, you're at Hoover. Uh, George Schultz had a long association there. He uh, just passed on at age 100. Uh, and if you wanted to offer a thought or two on Schultz and his legacy. Uh, and then the other uh, the question is, is, is a somewhat big one, which you get to close on, uh, and that is, much of, uh, of what we've been talking about, there's a lot of weight of history here. And, and the relatively recent history uh, of US policy toward Asia is about the incredibly dynamic Asia, right? The powerhouse, the leading uh, the world in so many things, um, not just a China rise story, but a regional rise story and very much even not a China story. Uh, and yet there's another narrative that comes in that says, maybe there's some cracks in the foundation of this. Maybe things aren't so great. And I know you've written extensively on that. Um, and I hate to do this to you, but you only got a few minutes <laughs> to answer both of those things. So let me throw it back to you for the last substantive word, and then we'll close out. Thanks. Um, yeah, those are wonderful questions. Also, it's a great question about um, uh, restoring the image of the enemy uh, in terms of in relation to China. I really liked that one, and and I think it's true, and, and, and it's back, but it's been growing. It hasn't just come out of the last two weeks of Biden. It's been growing since, I would say, Obama's last years of Obama. Um, let me let me mention uh, Secretary Schultz. Um, he did pass on last week. Um, for those who didn't didn't know, he was active uh, literally up until the very end. Um, I was amazed when I got to Hoover a few years ago that he was at every event. Uh, he would he would come regularly. In fact, the first talk that I gave at Hoover, he showed up, which is you know sort of mind blowing that former Secretary of State George Schultz would show up. But more than that. Not only did he come to every event, he was organizing. He was organizing uh, uh, programs and projects and initiatives at Hoover. He had one on governance in a, a new global world, and he had one on a national security task force. Um, and in fact, I was on a, um, a, a webinar with him just the week before he passed away, and he was comment. He was always. It was amazing how sharp he was. You know, he was someone who who reached across the aisle, uh, had friendships on both sides of the aisle, um, had decades of working to to maintain the most um, sober and, and rigorous approaches to thinking about problems and then the most realistic ways to approach those, uh, approach those problems. And you know, I, so everyone at Hoover worked with him for decades. I only had a few years, but even so I was privileged to be able to you know, talk to him about China relations, uh, be in small groups with him and ask him questions about it, uh, have one-on-ones. And I think everybody remembers that. And, and that type of, of, of not just what he did when he was in office, but the mentorship that he carried on for decades after that to carry on with new generations, how you think about these issues, I think is as much a legacy as what he did as secretary of state or secretary of uh, the treasury and labor and the like. So he will be sorely missed. Um, I'll finish up just a minute or so on the, on the last big question. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, I, 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 wrote a book called The End of the Asian Century uh, in 2017 that actually raised this very issue, which was um, there's another side to what's going on in Asia. I mean, Asia is 
extraordinarily vibrant and dynamic and has grown in ways that none of us could have imagined. And yet at the same time, there are enormous problems throughout the region that we must pay attention to. Demographic problems, uh, obviously environmental problems, uh, problems of innovation that, that we sort of think, you know, oh, Asia's incredibly innovative. And yet when you look behind the, the screen, in many cases, it's not as innovative as, as it used to be certain countries. Um, problems, of course, of, of intra-regional relations, security and the like. Um, and, and I think you're seeing that, look, you, you know, compared to a decade ago, um, China's macroeconomic growth has slowed dramatically. That's the new normal. It's taking us a while to catch up with that. Now, the fact that it's still the world's second, or depending how you count it, first largest economy, um, means that even slower growth adds an enormous amount, but there's not the China growing at 10%. And we have to recognize the, the slowdown that's happening. We have to recognize the slowdown in, in personal wealth in China, in, in net wealth. Um, looking at what's happened over the past year, the numbers say that China did very well during the pandemic uh, recession. And yet when you look at specifics like energy usage and other things, it, it looks like there was a more significant slowdown. Um, so, and, and then you could translate that, you can talk to other countries, you can talk about the problems of corruption in, in, uh, in, um, in India, you could talk about pol uh, political sclerosis in Japan uh, in many ways. I mean, the region struggles with um, a combination of not fully achieving potential, and then in some cases moving into a, a sort of advanced uh, democratic slowdown that that all nations ultimately get to in economics and you know lack of political participation uh, and the like. So my point is not to say that you know Asia's collapsing. It's not to say that Asia will will disappear. And I don't know if I don't think that's what the the uh, you know the question was intended, but rather to say that we should be more sophisticated in how we approach Asia. That there are as many uh, cracks as you put it. There are as many cracks in the facade and as many underlying weaknesses as there are strengths. And as those weaknesses are not addressed, issues of, um, you know, of, of gender rights or issues of uh, pollution, issues of political corruption, uh, issues of territorial disputes, as they fester, then these countries, which are over time getting wealthier and therefore able to, uh, to act with, with more assertion, uh, there is the chance of, of greater conflict and clashes. And, and we just need to be aware of that so that we don't get caught by surprise. I think that's the biggest issue of thinking about Asia is don't, don't believe there's just one linear uh, narrative or one linear approach that, that's going on to Asia. Don't be surprised and be thinking about how you would both protect our own interests but try to ensure and maintain stability in a region that is very dynamic, but is also very unsettled. Well, this has been a terrific hour and a great example of the prescription that Misha just offered of a sophisticated approach to understanding politics and foreign policy in Asia. Uh, if you want to uh, read more about Misha's view, on, on especially the issues of his uh, last uh, set of comments there, the books are Asia's New Geopolitics and The End of the Asian Century. So thank you, Misha, for a terrific hour. Thank all of thank to all of you uh, for joining us. And let me throw it back now to Raleigh to send us out. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jacques. Thank you, Michael. Terrific discussion. Um, and we have lots of other discussions uh, coming up live next week and in the ensuing weeks, as well as on our YouTube video channel, uh, which will host this talk as well as the one yesterday and all of our previous talks. So please, uh, please view them, uh, share them with your friends. Thank you again for a great discussion, and we hope to see you soon. Take care.